this world that's filled with so much noise and information, how do we really stand out and be who we were really meant to be? In this podcast, we focus on injecting you with positivity, optimism, and strategies all centered around helping you be who you were always meant to be in business and life. Be inspired to show up in your own skin to learn strategies, habits, and skills from others as we share our own life journeys and stories. There's no other you, and you know yourself better than anyone else. So be prepared to take away habitual tidbits, tactics that will encourage you to pursue and live your life, not the one others want you to live. Welcome to Stand Out Be You, where you don't have to be perfect, you just have to be you. Hello there, Tequila Daughter here with Stand Out Be You, and we have a guest here with us today that I am excited for you to hear all about her. She's a master certified life and weight coach, and she is on a mission to help women get excited about their lives all over again. Susie Rosenstein, did I say that correct? Rosenstein, very close. Good enough. (laughs) We are excited to have you on the show. Can you please help me fill in the gaps and tell us all a little bit more about you? Oh, sure. Tequila, thank you so much for inviting me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. So you got it right. I'm on a mission to help frustrated midlife women get excited about their lives. I was one of those frustrated midlife women. (laughs) And it's so important to understand that you can really open yourself up and learn to see life as full of opportunities, not as what you don't have, but what you do have. And I find that what happens is when people start to get older, they often start to see that their opportunities are shrinking. Yeah. And how are you able to relate to the women that you're speaking of? Well, like I said, I went through a period of time. First of all, I'm 54. I don't feel 54. And I know some of the uh, midlife. You don't look it either. (laughs) Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you. Sometimes I feel immature. (laughs) I know people can relate to that. I know we're supposed to like be adults all the time and everything, but it doesn't always work out that way. But really what happened to me was I had a long-term job. I'd worked in the uh, public health sector for 27 years and 19 of those years were at one job. And what happened was the last five years of that job, I started to realize that I was just really not happy. I didn't know what the problem was. I, I think I felt bored. I wasn't inspired. And I guess I felt stagnant. I knew something was off, but I wasn't sure what the problem was. And I started slowly but surely to talk to my friends about it or, you know, whine to my friends about it. (laughs) I I don't know what's wrong. I actually thought I might be depressed. But then I spoke to my doctor and she said, no, no, that's not it. And I kept searching. And then I realized that I wanted to change. I wanted something to change in my career, but I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized, unfortunately, I didn't have a life coach helping me, but then I realized that I was fearful. I was actually afraid. I thought I was excited about change, but really I wasn't. And what I came to understand was that I think I was really afraid that I had um, been there too long. And that feeling of being stagnant, I just thought that I was like, I aged out. I started to feel like I was saying that these opportunities weren't there anymore, that I'd been there too long for my own good. And just as I was starting to become a little bit more clear about this, I got that knock at the door and I got laid off. (laughs) (laughs) And then you know what happens? I had been fantasizing about it uh, off and on over the years, you know, oh, if I would just get a package and then when it (laughs) happens to you, it's horrible. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, it's so horrible. I could barely even hear myself think the way my heart was pounding and, you know, so um, it turned out to be one of those moments that it was so harsh when it happened, but it was a gift. It was a gift. I didn't realize it for some time, but in hindsight now, and eventually I did start to see that it really was a gift. But now, uh, and that's what led me to life coaching. Right. I hired a coach and she changed my life. And well, that's what happened. That was my story. And, and I wish that I knew then what I know now about how your thinking creates your feelings. And if I could have understood my fear a little bit more, because really it kept me in that job. It kept me stuck. 
for five years. And when I think about that, one time I did the calculation. I don't have it top of mind right now, but I calculated how many weeks that was and how many days that was. And it's just such a waste of time not to be who you really are and not to be doing what you really want to do. Yeah. Now, when you got that knock at the door and you had already been putting it out in the atmosphere, I always say, be careful what you put out there because it will come back to you. Did you already start thinking to line something out differently or it just the knock came and you didn't know what you were going to do next? I was shocked when the knock came. The manager who did the knocking, he had a funny look on his face. So as soon as I looked at him, I actually said, "Uh uh-oh, I think I'm being laid off. And then he couldn't tell me what was going on. But I said, he goes, we need you for a meeting. And there was just something in the tone of his voice that I knew something was very strange. So I figured it out very quickly, but I really didn't know. I mean, we'd been told that if you made it through this far, if you made it through the reorganization that was going on, that you were pretty much over the hump. So I was surprised. I had not lined anything up because I was still indulging in confusion. I still didn't know what I wanted. I was really, I was just so confused and frustrated. I couldn't see my way out of it. So when it happened, like I said, I didn't realize it was a gift right away. (laughs) But when I did realize it was a gift without having to make the decision of leaving a long-term job that looked so good on paper, I mean, it was a great job. It was uh, creative. I was helping people. I was in health education publishing. Yes. But I had just been there too long. So I wasn't growing anymore, but it was a great job. I had lots of benefits. I had a pension, you know, so I just felt I had the benefits for the family. I just felt that I couldn't leave the job without having a really solid plan, but I couldn't come up with a solid plan. So when I didn't have to make that decision, it freed me up to really think about what I wanted to do. Isn't that something that when we don't have it all planned out, it ends up actually working out better for us. It's hard to believe. (laughs) I guess the one thing I had figured out was something that I was missing in my job. Like it was cause oriented. I wasn't, I was definitely helping people, but not directly. And I missed that. My background was in applied social psychology. I have a master's degree and I'd always gravitated toward being fascinated with why people behave the way they behave. I guess in the work that I was doing for almost 30 years, It definitely had to do with health behavior, but it wasn't one-on-one. It was at the community level, and that's really what I missed. I missed that direct contact with people. I didn't know what to do about that, but I I was just coming to realize that that's what was missing for me. Yeah, and you knew it. I always say to individuals is... You know what your dream or your want is, but sometimes we're just misaligned. And it sounds as if you are misaligned. And when that happened, it's unfortunate. It almost realigned you to where you are now. Tell us a little bit more about where you are now. Thanks for asking. But you're right. That's exactly what happened. Uh, Every time I started to think about what I wanted to do, I kept thinking immediately, well, how can I do it? It's too hard. I'm too old to go back to school. It's too scary. What if I don't like the job? Like all those questions started to pop in as soon as I was just allowing myself to think about what I wanted. So that really kept me stuck. But what I'm doing now, oh my gosh, I couldn't be happier. I hired a coach. Mm -hmm. Uh, back in uh, whenever that was, four or five years ago. And she basically blew my mind. And I thought, hmm, maybe coaching's for me. So I asked her where she went to school. And she went to the life coach school. And so I thought, well, I'm having trouble making a decision. And I love the way that you coached me. I'm going to go check that out. So I had happened to get education severance from my job where I got laid off. And it was the exact same amount of money (laughs) as the tuition (laughs) training to be a life coach. So I thought, oh, that's it. So I took the check, literally, I took the check and I just put it in the bank and wrote a check and, and sent it off. Like it was within minutes that I transferred that whole thing. So what happened was I continued my training. I became master uh, coach certified. And I work with midlife women who are typically 
experiencing what I experienced. They're typically 45 to 50. Many of them are turning 50. And I was 50 the year I got laid off. So that's a beautiful coincidence. And they're unhappy in their long-term jobs. Now, sometimes people feel stuck and they're not a, a classic midlife age. Most people think of midlife as 40 to 60 or 45 to 60, something like that. But I think it's more a stage. Yeah. So midlife really, for some people, turning 50 freaks them out, right? So yeah. turning 50 is definitely something related to age. But a lot of times it has to do with they've been in their job more than 10 years. And like me, they're feeling stagnant. My clients tell me that they feel like life is passing them by. Yeah. And that's definitely how I was feeling. I was just so distracted. I just couldn't focus because I just kept thinking that. That's typically what happens. Another thing that happens with stage is empty nest or their kids are getting older and they don't need them as much as they did. So sometimes it's they're like high school age kids and my clients are starting to feel like they have more time. And the parenting isn't quite as physical as it is with younger children. Yes. Sometimes the kids have gone, like they've, they're off to university. So that is another thing that affects people. And then, of course, menopause is something, too, that affects the women I work with because things really do change when you hit menopause and it affects people very differently. But I would say the number one thing that my clients want to talk to me about is a career malaise. Something's not right with their career anymore. They just don't feel that same excitement. They're not making plans for the future anymore. They feel stuck and confused and for sure frustrated. I've had clients as young as um, in their late 20s start to feel this way in their 30s. And, and I've also had clients in their 60s who are mm -hmm. ready for a big change. So what I really do is help people with the transition, the transition of going from what they know to what they want but they don't know what they want <laughs> to help them yeah. figure out that roadmap. What's been the biggest transition that you've seen in like one of your clients with going through this whole entire process? Because I agree with you. I think it could be anyone can feel stuck when we don't feel like we're growing. You feel stuck. <laughs> so what's been the biggest transition that you've seen in an individual that you've worked with? Oh, my gosh. So one comes right to mind. So she had been working in a career for a long time, like it was well into the 20s of years mm -hmm. that she had this career. And she was close to her pension. And she was miserable. And so she was really struggling with, is it the responsible thing to do to leave a good career? Again, these careers look fine on paper. There's nothing wrong with the job. And she was so close to her pension, but she knew she needed a break. She just couldn't take it anymore. So she left and she started writing. Yeah. And that was a huge shift for her because she ended up writing a novel. Oh, wow. Yeah, a huge shift. And then I would say that's the biggest. Another big thing that has happened to a few people is they come to me thinking they need to leave their job. And after we work together, they find out that there's actually a lot of things they like about their job, but they needed to work on different parts of their life to create balance. So yeah. sometimes people do need to leave and sometimes they don't. Mm. I hear a lot of things there, you know, because it's like the Generation X, you know, if I could say that, we were taught to go into, well, really, maybe we weren't taught, but we just saw our parents staying with the same organization or company forever, that it gets this fear inside of us to even think about changing anything. <laughs> when our parents kind of taught us, go get a great job and you stay there, that's where you're supposed to be. <laughs> oh, I so relate to what you're saying. Like, I remember when I got my first job, it was in 1989, my first yeah. professional job out of grad school. And I just remember thinking it was a contract. And then the next job was a contract. And the next job was a contract. And then the fourth job was full-time permanent. I remember thinking, oh, this is it. I've <laughs> landed. I got full-time <laughs> permanent. And I wasn't the only one thinking that, but it was really, even then... That is definitely what I was striving for. Now, one thing that does complicate it, though, is that then I started to have children. Yeah. And to have a stable job when you're having children is a beautiful thing. I live in Canada, and we have very generous maternity leaves. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stable job, like in my stable job that I outgrew, I was able to have three maternity leaves. So there is a time 
and a place for everything. And I, like I said, I loved my job for many, many years. There was nothing wrong with it, but I needed to continue growing. So sometimes we can grow if we have a mentor in the place of employment. Sometimes we can grow if we find a hobby or another place to achieve. Sometimes we grow based on our community. Like if you happen to work with a lot of people that are very inspiring and positive. So I really do think that's something in common that my clients talk to me about. They don't always use the word, I need to grow, but what they do identify with is I'm stagnant. Yeah. So they identify with what's wrong. The problem is I'm frustrated. The problem is I'm not getting anywhere. The problem is I feel like life is passing me by. Uh, the problem is I'm starting to wonder if I've been here too long. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like it's misaligned with what you felt you were supposed to be doing in your life. I knew that there was more for me. Mm -hmm. Another thing kept popping into my head, and I found out about this in a very strange way. I've actually turned this into an exercise with my clients, and it's about envy. Mm -hmm. Now, envy isn't one of those emotions that we like to talk about. It's kind of embarrassing to feel envious. It's not anything a real mature adult would you know, brag yeah. about. <laughs> but what happened to me once was a situation where I felt envy and feeling envious opened up my mind to what I really wanted. So what mm -hmm. happened was I was doing a craft. It's needlepoint. Maybe your grandma does needlepoint. Like a lot of older ladies seem to do needlepoint. I didn't know many young people doing needlepoint. If it's got anything to do with crafts, I'm not good with it. But I, uh, <laughs> I grew up in a family that does all of it. I like to be like, hey, we should make this a business. <laughs> oh, well, that's exactly what happened. So I was working on a needlepoint project for the first time. And I was in over my head. I knew one basic stitch. So I went to the needlepoint store. There was such a thing. <laughs> and I walked in and I was blown away by what I saw. There were these beautiful canvases all over the walls and they were high ceilings. So they were everywhere. All the beautiful colored threads. There was a whole wall of all these threads. And I was just, oh my God, it's beautiful. This is amazing. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew one stitch. But so I go in and on the left-hand side of the room at the back was one of these high tables, like a craft table, with six or seven women huddled around, leaning over, and the owner of the store was teaching them about needlepoint. She was like physically helping them with their projects, showing them new stitches, showing them how to use beads with their stitches. And I just walked in and I was blown away that this woman who owned the store figured out how to do something she loved, how to teach other women and share her passion and how to make a living. It's not that I wanted to be in a needlepoint business, but I was like, oh, look what she did. She's my <laughs> age and she figured this out. She was so happy. She was so into teaching all these women of different ages about all these stitches. And I was envious. I went back to my public sector, you know, union <laughs> position. <laughs> where I've been there for decades. And I just started to think, wow, what is going on? What am mm. I thinking about what I saw that can help me understand what I'm missing? And one of the things was teaching. Mm -hmm. One of the things was her passion. And another thing was that she was an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I guess I'd imagined, I'd always imagined that I would be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't. I had a union position. Yes. <laughs> I mean, talk about extremes. And so I just started to think, sometimes we forget how old we are. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm 50 and I still haven't done that. I'm 50. How did I turn 50? And I still hadn't done that. So that envy, and I encourage my clients to really think about if there was anything in their lives that where they just went, wow, I want that. And sometimes it's a relationship that you have with somebody. Sometimes it's, it's obvious, like a car or a home or a vacation. I had one client tell me that she was envious of a friend of hers who just had so much flexibility in her day. And another one who had a lot of friends. She was envious that somebody her age had so many friends. Yeah. So you never know what you want sometimes until you see somebody else with it. So I encourage people, think about envy. If envy bites you in the butt, pause, notice what it is, because maybe there's some insight there into what you really want. You know, it's great that you're bringing this up because it's almost like we've been for a long time taught not to sit for a long time within our feelings 
But when you do sit there and you feel that, it leads you down a different path. And most times it's the actual right path. Yeah, I love that you said that. So what I tell my clients is you have to want what you want. It's okay to want what you want. Mm -hmm. And some people identify more with feelings and some people identify more with their thoughts. Yeah. But what I teach is that your thoughts create your feelings. So if you mm-hmm. notice the feeling, you can pause, experience the feeling, and ask yourself, why am I feeling this? What's going on? And a thought will pop in. Yeah. And you, can, you may be confused about it. It may be trying to be edged out by another thought. But you will figure it out that when you think this, it creates this feeling. Yeah. And some people identify more with thoughts. So for them, they might see a thought that they're thinking. And then they can notice how that thought makes them feel because a thought does create your feelings in no time flat. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, why do you want to make an impact? That is such a good question. I want to make an impact because people, women especially, I mean, I care about men too, (laughs) but women deserve to live the lives they want to live. Yeah. That's why. And I love helping people. I think of myself as a connector. I love to connect ideas. I love to connect people with their dreams. I love to connect people with their thoughts, with their feelings. And I love to just really help people gain perspective on their thinking so that they can create the lives they want to create. Yeah. That people have more power than they think they do. There's so many limiting beliefs out there. We are our own worst enemies sometimes. Yes. So when, when I work with my clients, we work, it's like peeling an onion, right? You just peel the layers back, you get the perspective yeah. and you see, you empower yourself and you see where there's wiggle room, what you can change and what you can't change and really focus on creating the results that you want to create. Yeah. You've told us your story and you are giving back to your community. You're helping other individuals based on your story overcome something that you too went through. Who has got you here? Who's inspired you to be who you are today? Oh boy, that is an interesting question. I just had a bunch of thoughts go through my mind. So what's interesting about my story is that my parents died when I was a kid. So I didn't have mentorship or traditional parenting. I was raised by a stepmom. So Mm -hmm. I did have parenting, but I did have that trauma in my childhood. So she had a huge influence on providing stability and the understanding that you have to work hard Mm -hmm. and that life's not fair. You know, life is not fair. And as soon as you let that go, that expectation that life should be fair, you're a lot happier. And then I think what happened because I was resilient, because I, you know, I did have a few large bumps along (laughs) the road in my childhood. I sought out people as mentors in my life. And Mm -hmm. I remember Well, even somebody I dated, I remember thinking, wow, he's wise. I I need that in my life right now. I need that wisdom. And then I dated somebody else when I was in my 20s who was very loyal. Mm -hmm. I thought, that's interesting. I think I need that. I like loyalty. Mm -hmm. I chose a a professor in my undergrad and grad school who was kind of like a father figure to me. He Mm -hmm. had a shared background of some stuff in childhood, and we just really connected. And he became uh, very important in my life. And, and then as an adult, I have to say somebody I've learned so much from has been the founder of the Life Coach School. Her name is Brooke Castillo. And I definitely think of her as my mentor. She's yeah. really opened my eyes and given me so much new perspective. So I think for me, it hasn't been one person. I think it's a combination of being fortunate and being resilient that I have recognized in myself what I've needed to guide me. And I have made a point of, of finding amazing people, men and women in my life, not sticking to them like glue, but making sure that I had the people in my life I needed at that time to keep growing and learning from. And I would say from every job I've had, there's been at least one or two people that have been shining stars, even the job I was bored yeah. at. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think that that is, like I said, a combination of luck, but mostly resilience um, and the ability to overcome adversity. And I think anybody who's been through anything and has learned how to be resilient 
is pretty good at that skill. Sometimes you can't really see what you need, but once you clear it up, you see it, and then you're just able to recognize that in other people and then be open to what you can learn from Mm -hmm. them. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes a lot of sense. I, I think that the people are a walking gift. We just don't realize that every person has a gift inside of them to give. And you may be given that gift to a person in a time that they need it most in their life and you you didn't even realize it. And that's what makes us so amazing, I think, as human beings is that we're able to connect on that type of level. Yeah, and I love being in a position right now where I'm meeting so many amazing people. The coaching community that I'm a part of at the Life Coach School is so warm and so inspiring, and I really feel like I'm in an an amazingly supportive community there. And then the women I'm meeting, and I do have some males (laughs) as clients, but really I'm all about, my jam is midlife women. And these women are so freaking awesome, and they Mm -hmm. come from all over the place. I just love watching them blow their own minds as, you know, I've got amazing tools and as I'm able to work with them and just to help them see what they want and and see their way to figure out how they're going to get it. It's so exciting. I get just such a charge out of sharing what I know now, you know, with (laughs) with women and helping them grow. It's it's so much fun. And I love that you've made it. This is a full on business that you have and you're working with clients from all over the world I would guess this or is that true it is true I mean not from every country but I (laughs) I love it with zoom and technology it's so easy with the internet to have a client from Australia to have a client from the UK to have clients from all over the place as long as they've got a good wi-fi connection or good um, internet connection it's so easy And that's the other thing I like when somebody contacts me, if, if they listen to my podcast or they read my blog and they feel a connection, I offer a free mini insight consult, Mm -hmm. a 20 minute consult. So we can hop on the phone or on zoom and make sure that the connection is good because I want people to feel like there's a good connection that they feel really great about fit. And I also want to make sure that I am working with clients that are ready for change. So my clients are ready. You need to want to be coached and they need to be open to it. They need to be open to taking a giant flashlight and shining it on their brain and say, what's going on in there? And to really uh, be ready to do the work and reap the rewards. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Susie, what do you see for yourself? I know you are where you are right now, but where do you see everything going? Where, what do you see for yourself? Well, I started a podcast. Like, basically, I'm still relatively new. If I look at my career of being working for over 30 years, 27 of those years, the vast majority of the time was yeah. doing something else. While I feel like my business really is growing and I'm very excited about it, in the scheme of things, I see myself working easily for another 15 years, 20 years, because as I said, with the internet, it doesn't matter. I'm home-based and it's just so exciting to work with people. So this summer I launched my podcast Mm -hmm. called Women in the Middle, Loving Life After 50. And it is growing and it's so much fun. You can find it on iTunes or you can find it on my website, susierosenstein.com. And I am going to be starting to interview people. I've done one interview so far. I have a few more lined up. These are women who have learned to love their life after 50. So they have made a big change. Yes. And they will be talking about what it was like for them uh, to be frustrated and how they moved past it. What kind of thoughts did they need to start thinking? And what was it that helped them breakthrough because other women find it so inspiring to hear these stories. So what I see for myself is to continue to grow my business, to continue to work with women, to understand, to learn online marketing better (laughs) so that I can find my people because as an online entrepreneur, you know, 
that yeah. it's one thing to have a gorgeous website, but you have to figure out marketing so you can find your people. You got to get the traffic towards you. Got to get the traffic. So that's what I'm learning about right now. I'm learning about traffic. And I see myself ultimately having some kind of a course, mm-hmm. an online course, or having some kind of a membership group or yeah. maybe doing some group work. I have some ideas that I'm pretty excited about, but that's where I see it going in the future. Eventually there'll be, you know, ways to work with more people rather than just one-on-one. But right now I have a signature program called Nine Steps to Regret Proof Your Life. It's a three-month program and my clients are seeing amazing results. Yeah. So we really get into it. We work on regret proofing, ways to make sure that you don't have regrets about your contribution, which is your career, about your relationship with yourself and your relationship with others. So those are the areas we work on. And I really move my clients through an experience where at the end of it, they're very clear on their priorities and they know exactly the kind of thought work and mindset they need to move forward to create the life they really want. Yeah. Susie, you are definitely standing out and you're being you. Yes, you are. And oh my gosh, thank you. You have shared with us today amazing stories about your life and some of the amazing stories that you're doing for others. And we're looking forward to continue to see the amazing things that you are going to do for others that are going to come to you through that traffic. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. And you know, what's so interesting is the two of us met online. Yes, we did. And I love that. I took a risk. I didn't know who you were. And now I fall in love with you. (laughs) But now you're stuck with me, Tequila. We're going to be friends. You can have a shot anytime. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to mention one other thing. I do have a freebie on my website that people can download. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, tell us all about it. And the listeners, anything that she says, of course, I will put in the show notes, but tell us all about it. Go. Okay, that's great. Well, it's a freebie. It's called you know, people are in a funk. I like to call this state of confusion a midlife funk. Yeah. And so um, I created something called 10 Simple Ways to Bust Out of Your Midlife Funk. Mm-hmm. And it just gives you some really solid ideas that you can start thinking about right now to shake things up a little bit so you can keep moving forward. It's free. All you need to do is go to www.susierosenstein.com slash midlife funk. Perfect. Get out of your funk. You need to go see Susie. Susie, I have some personality questions. I always like to do this at the end because it's been such a pleasure to hear everything that you're doing, but let's get a little bit more into your personality. Are you ready? I don't know, Tequila. I do not know if I'm ready. (laughs) Well, it won't be too hard. It's just personality, and you already have loads of personality, so we just want to add on top of what you've already given us. What would you tell your 10-year-old self today about life? That's a great question. And I would tell them to stop thinking life has to be fair. Honestly, I think that is a beautiful lesson that you need to work hard and you need to go get what you want. I did work hard, but I can see times in my life where I was waiting for something. Yeah. I was waiting for somebody to acknowledge me or I was waiting for, uh, you know, to be recognized or I was waiting to be noticed so I might get a promotion or something like that. And I would just recommend not to wait and just embrace the understanding that it's your responsibility to go get what you want. And that's why it's so important to dream. For most of us, the last time we actually sat down and thought about what we wanted It might have been 30 or 40 years ago when we graduated from high school or college, right? That's a long time ago, but we get so caught up with the whirlwind of life that we don't press pause and think about what we want. And then once we figure out what we want, we got to go get it. Yeah. You just can't wait. You got to go get it. So I wasn't horrible with that lesson, but Mm -hmm. I can definitely see times where I was uncertain about the importance of that lesson that you just got to go get what you want. Go get it. I love it. What's the farthest city that you've ever visited or traveled to from your birth city? Let's see. The farthest. It might be Tel Aviv. Yeah, it's probably there. Has that been recent or a while back? Oh, that was a while back. I haven't been there in about 20 years. But what we did start to do recently is we take sailing trips as a family. 
So we have had a chance to explore the islands in the Caribbean. Nice. So that's what we've done as a family, uh, a few of those trips. And that's been so much fun. So much fun. Family time. It's important. As you do know, it's so important to find times where everybody's unplugged. Yeah. Right? And so (laughs) when you're on a boat... It's a you're great way to unplug, right? You're unplugged. <laughs> so when you're not looking at the fish, we always play bananagrams. <laughs> so a great family time. I love it. I love it. Yeah. This one's fun. If you could be any animal in the world, what animal would you be and why? Oh, that's so easy for me. I would be a whale. Oh, why? I love that. I love whales. Whales mm-hmm. are my passion. It's my hobby. I go on whale watches all over the place. And I make sure to go on a whale watch every year. And what I love about whales is their ability to communicate and everything I learn about their ability to communicate. It just seems unreal that an animal that lives in the sea and is so huge and, you know, what looks to us like cumbersome, but of course they're swimming, so they're not. It's just that ability to communicate. I always imagine whales just have infinite wisdom. And I had an experience once where I was less than 12 inches away from the whale's eye. And I was in a tiny boat leaning over. It was the gray whales of Baja, Mexico, in San Ignacio Lagoon. And as I was leaning over looking at the whale, and the whale's eye was about the size of my head, it blinked. (gasps) And when it blinked, I just burst into tears. I don't know what it was. It was just so spiritual that that happened. And yeah, I would be a whale. You'd be a whale. My dog is barking now. We're talking about animals. So he says he knows what we're talking about. (laughs) And you know what? He's big. He's 130 pounds. He's in Newfoundland. So he's a big boy. And he's saying, mommy, I am hungry. I know. Well, with that, Susie, I really want to thank you for taking the time to come on Stand Out Be You and speak with the listeners and share you with us. And we look forward to seeing everything that you have to offer in the future. And again, listeners, to get in touch with Susie, I will link everything in the show notes. And remember to always stand out and be you and that you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be you. If you have a story and you are impacting the world, we want to hear it. Go to tequiladaughter.com and apply to be on the show. We are excited to hear how you are changing your community.